Share the life, share the life. Morning. Share the life, share the life. I'm DJ Maurisha and I'm coming to you live and location here at the JNF Hospital here in Bastia St. Kitts where a um, great deal of work is ongoing at the moment to arrest the leaks and the overdue leaky roofs that has been here for some years so there has been many chatter negative chatter about um, the JNF hospital and what is not being done well I am here this morning um, to give an update to what is taking place here at the JNF. A great deal of work would have started since the election of the new Labour administration on the Prime Minister Joe. But one of the main issues that has been there for some years, and anyone who have visited the JNF hospital in recent time will know, as soon as a shower of rain comes down, the buckets and the pails and the sandbags and the um, blankets come out to stop the water um, from overtaking the various departments. Well, in addition to that, um, I know there might have been some reports that DJ Marisha is now doing some work here at the JNF. So let's put an end to all of those fake news and chatters and give it to you the way it is. But before I do that, I want to show you the roof area here and the private ward that has been closed for some years now due to the lack of leaks the ward had to be shut down, could not be used. Um, just want to show you the work that has been done over the past week on this roof. Um, I understand that um, since this work was done, we had a serious storm that passed through last week and it stood the test. There was no leaks from the roof. So I want to thank um, the folks who are here doing this wonderful, wonderful job. But just before I um, get back to the other side, I just wanted to show you the finished product, what it looked like here. So let me get back and give the updates that I'm here to give. Because it appears as though it's only negatives you are seeing on social media in regards to the massive work that has been undertaken here at the JNF since August 5th of 2022. So this is the view from the top of the private ward. So from my assessment here, the um, roof situation here, the leaks, unless something else happens, I can say that the leaks to this roof has been resolved um, for the time being. This is my first walkthrough since the... Um, work was done so um, I can say based on the report I received that since the rain last week there was no physical leak that came through now yes there's some garden work that need to get done here in the back we will deal with that 
angel course. But overall, I am pleased to report that the private ward roof, the leaks, has been addressed and have put them behind us. And um, the next phase is to deal with the interior, the mold situation, the clean, interior cleaning, the fixtures such as the lighting, the faucets, the sinks, the plumbing, painting, the exterior doors and everything else that need to be addressed. But all in all, the major issue was the leak and the roofs. And that is what has to be attacked first before any other major work to be done. So I'm going back here from the private ward roof. I'm looking across towards the, um, the medical area where the work is continued and going there with the folks doing their ceiling. Now, if you look on the ground, you see some pails. That technology that they're using to repair the leaks on this roof, we don't manufacture these things in St. Kitts. You know? And for the life of me, I don't understand why people put politics into everything. But since it's politics, let's talk politics. Let's get to it. And I won't be long with you this morning. I just want to give an update that I was asked by Prime Minister Ju to be a part of the team to work on the accreditation process for the JNF. I came into St. Kitts on the 13th of September of last year and I started my service here at the JNF on the 18th of September. And my very first walkthrough of the institution with the DHI and he asked me for my assessment and I explained to him at that time I said um, Dr. Morton if I were a inspector that came in here to if I was an inspector that came in here to do an inspection, it would be very easy for me to say cease operations and till certain things are taken care of. But I'm not here for that. I am here to assist with the assessment. So basically, there is some steps that have to be taken. And one of the first steps, and not one of, the first step in order to accomplish the, um, the mission, the first step was to deal with the leak and the roofs. Without taking care of the leaks and the roof, no matter what you do on the interior, the problem will still exist because once rain comes down, that's it. The place is going to flood. Whatever repairs you done on the inside would be um, basically a waste of time. So I want to say this morning to the folks in the Federation of St. Kitts Nevis, the folks in the diaspora, let's give credit and let's give thanks to a leader in the name of the Honorable Dr. Terence Jew, Minister of Health in the island of St. Kitts Nevis. Because when I came and I did my assessment and explained what the situation, my finding, I'm coming from a facility management background. Most people who knows me in New York know that I work at Bronx Lebanon in the engineering department. I was the lead electrician and I had the opportunity to attend many courses from confined space, hazmat, uh, boiler training, uh, HVAC, name it, fire and safety, anything you think about when it comes to facility management and 
anything to do with healthcare, even down to nursing when you come to the needle six procedures, coronavirus. We were trained in California at one of the best hospitals in California, the Pfizer Hospital. We went across the country, the entire U.S. training other institutions. So I have a great deal of experience under my belt. It's unfortunate that some people only know me as a DJ, as DJ Marisha. I've been an electrician for over some 40 plus years. And as I said, I work in the health industry so almost 30 years. So when Dr. Drew asked me for my assistance, reluctantly I said yes, because it was a couple of times that we spoke and I said no, because I know our people. If I come down to think is to make my contribution, the first thing they're gonna say is, oh, he was arguing and cussing the farm administration because he was looking to work. My good people, I wasn't looking to work. I am okay. But as Gwyneth says to me, and Patricia and a lot of other people that convinced me, they said to me, Jeff, you campaign about the wrongs that was taking place in the Federation. And if now the government change and you have been asked by the Prime Minister to come in and assist, why are you not assisting? You're defeating the purpose of all of the work that you put in. And in taking those things into consideration, I said yes to the Prime Minister, I will come and do my part. And when I came in at first, it was not easy for me to decide to stay on because one thing I realize here in this Bill of Federation is the procurement process. The procurement process is very long and drawn out. And the issues here at the JNF requires expedition and fast track. Because if you don't fast track the repair of this roof, if you don't expedite, expedite the process of repairing this roof, nothing underneath this roof means anything. The patient, the nurses, the doctors that are doing a very good job don't mean anything if you don't take care of these roofs and then take care of the interior. So in speaking to the management staff here at the JNF and giving them my updates and whatever and they're telling me about the process, I said, you know what, I cannot work with that process. And I reached out to the DHI, which is Dr. Morton, and I explained to him my situation, how I feel about the work to be done here at the JNF. And he also explained to me the process and he would speak to the Prime Minister. And after a couple of weeks, I don't think things was moving fast enough. So sometime last November, November of 2023, I reached out to the Prime Minister and I explained to him and I sent him a report via WhatsApp of the situation. And in a matter of days, the Prime Minister called me and said, Jeff Roy, I got your message and I understand what you said. I'm going to send a team of people over to the JNF to meet with you. Let them know what you need done. And the team came and we tore all the roofs here. Because anyone who's familiar with the JNF is not like in North America where everything is in one location. The properties here. The facilities make up of different locations, different areas, different buildings. And after I explained to them and everything what we need, they said, okay, they will come back the next day to do their measurements. Now, I explained to them, I don't want you to just come and do a measurement. I need to know what time frame we're working in. Because the complaints I'm getting throughout my walkthroughs from various staff is, oh, people always come walk through here with a pad and whatever and nothing get done. And I assure them, I said, for me, I am not here for not doing anything. I am here to assist Prime Minister Joe in a project that he asked me to assist with. And he's serious about getting this place fixed, and I, I have the ability to get the work done. So give me until the first quarter of 2024, and if we are not getting any place, then you guys could have another conversation with me. But for now, I have confidence in the conversation that Prime Minister Joe gave me, that he want this work done, and he just want me to let him know what he need. 
And, you know, it's amazing that this was in November. So I figure I need to know the time frame we're working with. So I asked the gentleman, I said, you know, how long would it take to get the material in the country that you need to get this work done? And he told me, well, it's going to be about two months because these materials don't, are not manufactured here in the Federation. We have to get it out of China. So it's based on the shipping process. I said, okay, two months, November. I consider November dead. I consider December is holiday season that's dead. So I said January, February, March. So I put my marker on March that by March we should get some kind of work going. And um, by June when the hurricane season comes around, if we are not complete, if we have not completed all of the roofs, most of them should be done so that we don't have that leaking problem and we can focus on the interior. Well, to my amazement, you know, I reached out to the Prime Minister last Friday morning and he called me back right away and explained to me that the material have arrived on island and the work has started and the shower of rain that we had last week and the private um, ward building stood the tests. There was no leaks coming from the roof. So I am very happy and I'm very pleased to bring to you what the work is being done here. So, my good people, what I can say to you, naysayers out there, is this. There are many of us that have traveled out, and we traveled out for a better life. Some of us decide we're going to stay out there and we're not coming back. I believe in giving back to my community, and I know many of you have the ability to. So, just as I am here, trying to make my contribution and it's a damn good one because i couldn't say it without any water in my mouth this was not done in seven years under team unity administration from 2015 to 2022 prime minister drew took office on august 5th 2022 dj marisha came in here started at the jnf on the 18th of September. We are now in February of 2024 and the work has been done. Which means that the work could have get done before if these people was doing their work. If these politicians that was out there taking all these millions coming from the CBI and everything, if they was focusing. And from what the Prime Minister explained to me, I think I could share it with the public. He said to me, Jeff Roy, the work that has been done on the roof at the JNF is a collaboration between ROC Taiwan and the government. The work has been done by folks out of Taiwan and local contractors here on the island. The process went through the proper procedure. I fast-tracked, as he said, he, the Prime Minister Joe, fast-tracked the project. From November when I spoke to Dr. Drew, November of 2023, and we are now in 2024, February. Check that. In record time, not only the procurement process was done with the people of Taiwan, ROC Taiwan, and the government, the Office of the Prime Minister, Department of Health, and I want to take this time, you know, to thank Dr. Morton, Mrs. Maynard, and the management team here at the JNF that has been communicating and working with me in getting the process moved. And it, ha it was not an easy process. It's very time consuming and it's very, for whatever reason, the procurement process here in the Federation, it is a very, it's a lot of red tape, put it simple, a lot of red tape to get things done. The work in itself is not hard to do. It's the red tape to get the material and the labor to get the work done. So 
I came in and I spoke to the Prime Minister and I spoke to the management team at the JNF and I said, listen, while I'm here, I don't know how long I will be here for, but these two words I want us to practice is expedition, uh, expedite, and fast track. These roofs that are leaking need to be expedited. The repairs must be done ASAP. The interior, we can deal with the interior as we go along. So I'm not going to be long with you this morning, my good people. I'm not going to be long with you this morning. I just wanted to, like I said, come here and show you the work that is being done. Dr. Morton, come back this way. I'm going to come down. So that is, um, I just see Dr. Morton. So I am going to link with him a quick minute so that we could um, get a chat with him about the work that is being done here. So let's take a quick walk down on the lower end so that we can show you Dr. Dr. Morton and the team. So let me turn the camera around. Yeah. So I'm going to take a quick walk down around here. So folks have said to me time and time again, uh, Mr. Marisha, why don't you give a live from the JNF? You went to you went to Nevis and you gave a live. So why not a live from the JNF? And I have explained to them that uh, the situation is that in my capacity here as the quality assurance officer. I would not want to get up on my own to just do a live. So given the okay by the Minister of Health, the Honorable Prime Minister Joe, I decided this morning that it's important to come and give a quick update. We are here at the oncology unit here. Yes, there's an, an oncology unit here at the JNF. So, a lot of good things are happening here. So, at the end of the day, I just want to give the folks a quick opportunity. So, this area here that is up next on the repair is um, the medical and surgical ward. So, this is the outside here of the private ward which is going to be repaired as well and um, will be done in record time but as I said the technology that is being used and employed here to stop the leaks on the roof is not something that we have locally here in the Federation. This is something that has to come from overseas and I'm happy to report that came in and the folks are doing a good job. I approve of what I see there and the roof of the private ward. So <laughs> I have Dr. Morton here, the DHI, um, in charge here at the JNF. So Dr. Morton, I, I spoke with you earlier about the work that has been done. I just gave a quick update on my arrival here last September when you gave me the walkthrough. And you asked me for my opinion and I said what I saw. Now, since then a great deal of work has been done and you guys have been working hard and I have seen Prime Minister you expedite this process to get the leaks and we here on the roof. There's many negatives out there in social media, as always. As always. <laughs> but I have seen many positives in a very short space of time because like I just said there, yeah, you know, <laughs> like I just said there, um, a government was there for, from 2015 to 2022. These leaks was there. Trees was growing out of the drain. And between September of 2023, we are now in February, not even middle as yet, and Prime Minister Joe was able to secure what necessary to get these leaks arrested. So could you just speak to the people? You're online. Oh. 
Live Life. <laughs> You're alive. Excuse me. Um, yeah, so, like I said, I'm Dr. Speak, Morton. Speak I'm up, the speak, director speak. of health institution. Speak so, up loud. the hospital compound in JNF, it's about an 11 acre compound, and scattered about it, it's 14 different buildings, some connected with corridors, some not connected. But the key thing is that um, when I would have started here, which would have been September 2022, every single one of those 14 buildings had leaks, pre-existing leaks. And some were worse than some, but total summary was that it was pretty bad. Um, when we did some investigations, we found out that due to um, a specification of the roof design, persons in the past had tried to see how the roof leaks could be addressed as recently as like 2014 or so. They were trying to see how it could be addressed, but it has some difficulties regarding um, the type of sealant technology um, that was being used. Um, but it seemed as if efforts to genuinely address it, uh, like they went dead in the water. So when that was reported um, to the Prime Minister, um, he wanted action to be taken on it because he did not wish for the hospital to have these kinds of issues because it's, it's embarrassing for a health institution of a nation of our cannibal to be suffering from something that's rectifiable. Um, by the time Mr. Marsha had come on stream, and um, we were able to get a proper systematic kind of analysis as to what is the root of the problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And oops, just one second, just one second. With regards to the roof of the prob with the root of the problem and within relatively short order, um, the plans came through. One of them was to tap into the resource that we have here, which is um, the Taiwanese person. So the Taiwanese embassy, they had assisted in the past with the repairs of some roofs in St. Kitts that had a similar problem. And what was noted was that they had to import certain materials and technology that were not available to us here. And whatever they repaired, it never leaked again. So it, it showed that something is there that could fix the problem. They were recontacted, they understood. They came and did their assessment and they said yes um, it can be fixed using a combination of methods and in tutus they went they imported the materials and they began the process immediately one of the key areas that we're focusing on is the private ward because just to put it point blank it's it was um, a main source of income basically for the hospital and it was also a main source of comfort mm -hmm. for persons if they were hospitalized if they wished to um, have that level of privacy with regards to them in their vulnerable state, it was an option that was available to them. When COVID came around, the private ward ended up becoming um, a center of activity because that was the only area that had um, individual rooms for the isolation and individual ventilation systems regarding um, each one had its own air conditioning unit, etc. So it was suitable. Now, ideally, the whole hospital should have been like that, but Unfortunately, that was the only area that was like that. Um, it was used for the COVID time, but after the COVID period, um, it remained closed. Um, some of it was due to infectious disease control and sanitation, but after a while, it, it just got neglected. By the time um, we were able to reinvestigate what's going on at the private ward, that's when it was noted that what were once small roof problems in the absence of um, maintenance work over all those months and months, it had ballooned into some massive roofing issues and it was no longer suitable to be um, open to the general public. So the Taiwanese, they're assisting with the repairs to that roof um, and hopefully, because they've been working very well, so I don't even have to say hopefully, I can nearly say with confidence that it should be able to be opened in a few months time and once we have that ward available, it would give us more flexibility to get some more work done on some of the other wards and then after that is done then everything can be open and readily available to the general public They're even helping us with the psychiatric ward as well which was that probably was the roof in one of the worst conditions and um, they're assisting with that um, apart from those roofing areas there were issues in the back of the hospital with regards to the mog um, that is also being addressed um, by a con that's, that's a local contractor firm a local construction firm that Mr. Errol Williams via the Public Works Department that work continues and we are also looking into getting some repairs done for the area by the laundry and um, CSSD. So basically 
repair work is happening all over the hospital. Sometimes some people have been saying, if we have intentions to move to a new hospital, why would we be having all of this hullabaloo with the old hospital? Very simple. In any country you meet with any kind of health standards, you have to maintain the health standards for the sake of the safety of all of the population that you're serving right down to the very end. You cannot say, this is leaking, just enjoy it for two to three years because a new hospital is coming in two to three years. Although we have full intentions to build it and it will get done, delays could happen, unpredictable things could happen, and if that is to happen and we have to stay here for a longer time, doesn't make sense making people enjoy it for a longer time. Also, um, all of the buildings that are here that we're investing in, we are not going to just abandon them. They're going to be repurposed for other uses within the Ministry of Health with more details of that repurposing to come in the future times. So that's basically the whole process. So it's just good to know that um, we have a lot of mobility with regards to health. When we identify an issue, we are very lucky that um, the government, the Prime Minister, who is also Minister of Finance and Minister of Health, we are very lucky to have him there such that the health issues can be taken seriously quickly, that the mobilization can happen on issues quickly because health is life and death, health is comfort and vulnerability, and it's just good that that kind of framework is set up because health was really in a bad state when we came. Um, I, I, I <laughs> I hesitate to explain certain things in detail. I'll just say it was in a really bad state when we came. We've been doing lots of work over the course of the past year and a half was the total time that we've been here. It's been a lot of things to clean up and a good chunk of what we've been cleaning up is just not suitable to kind of expose to the general public like that. So we've just been working silently. It's been, I will say, although I, I ignore the social media, it has been trying when you know you're doing all of this work every single day so hard cleaning up all this mess and then people have the audacity to be putting out things to make it seem as if this problem that was like eight years in the brewing that we are just addressing that it's failing because <laughs> that's that's only the, that's the annoying part that's why i have to start ignoring because if i really take this on i get by this <laughs> but um but no the truth is that we are all competent, we're all capable, we're all hard working, everybody that's working in all honesty. We are we're not even working to say we're digging out anybody eye. We're we're working we're working for a fraction of what other people work for in other places, to put it that way. It's just that we are dedicated to ensuring that the citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis have a good healthcare system. So <laughs> As Dr. Mohotan, um, DHI, Director of Health Institute, um, I'm happy that I get a chance to um, speak to you publicly because I've been saying publicly on my, plat on my podcast weekly oh, okay. and individually when people meet me and talking about the situation here. I try to explain to them that from I came here in September, I have nothing to give you but praise because you have been communicating um i see that you are trying when things are prolonging and i reach out to you and ask for permission to speak to the prime minister you have never denied me that opportunity anything to speed up things. you always said to me mr marisha anything to speed up things mm -hmm. and a lot has been sped up so i give the prime minister a lot of credit mm -hmm. to where we are but also i got to give you the credit because i believe in chain of command and at any time had you said to me, no, Mr. Marisha, I prefer you to hold off, I would have had to follow that directive. But you have never done that. You have always said, Mr. Marisha, whatever it takes to get the job done, get it done. So I want to thank you for that and for your work. I don't know if you know this, you know, your, your mother taught me in school. <laughs> from, <laughs> your, your mother taught me from, from primary school all the way up, teacher die. Oh, okay. okay? Um, a lot of teachers taught me singing Jackie, Miss Henry, Miss Payne, Miss Rogers, but your mother was like a mother to me, so I know you don't know this, so I'm giving you a public <laughs> uh, explanation now. And in addition to that, Dr. Morton, you spoke about the new hospital. I have been approached by many people on the streets, and they're saying, boy, Marisha, I hear you up the hospital. Why you don't advise them not to 
move the hospital because there's so much land up there. And I tried to explain to them, you guys would have to come and do a walkthrough as I did yeah. and understand the need mm -hmm. for a new hospital and in a different area. Because but up I, here, I, I could, I could speak on it. you could speak on it, sure. Yeah, so I understand why certain people would be saying, um, I mean, there's, there's a sentimental value attached to it that here's where the hospital is, they're accustomed to it. It's in a relatively central enough location and it's been the point that people are accustomed to using as their point of contact for finalized healthcare. There were quite a few problems. Um, the first issue that came up is that we took the smart route when we first came in and we realized that post-COVID things had changed globally with regards to how <coughs> how a health institution is respected. Prior to COVID, it was possible for you to just explain to everyone ranging from... Oops, Go ahead. No, to explain to everyone ranging from... To explain to everyone ranging from um, investors to... Um, even though to cruise agencies, etc. You could just explain to them because they ask, what, what can your health institution do? And you could just say, we have PT scan services available, we have this and that specialist available. That was in the past. Since COVID has ended, now they are asking for an international stamp of approval, which is in the form of an international accreditation, meaning a body that is um, internationally recognized for certifying health institutions has to come down here and has to basically say that everything from a and &E to lab to radiology to the conditions that patients are going to be experiencing to the wait times for certain things etc all of that meets the international standards of um, either grade a b or c and you can put it up you don't have to ask any questions once people see that they know that your health institution is certified we contacted those persons and unfortunately due to aspects of infrastructure layout this health facility it can't on a whole qualify for accreditation. We can get portions of the hospital accredited, so we can make sure that our staffing, operational systems, etc., that those are there, but the institution as a whole, it cannot. Structurally. Structurally. Um, it was, I don't think it was ever built with that in mind, so that, that was one of the issues. Now, with regards to the modifications that would be needed for it to reach that level, it would have been so extensive. Just, just the front of house, the main building where you enter with a and &E, etc. The structural changes that would have to take place here alone would be so extensive. Just to give an idea, to get some structural changes done in the back third of the hospital, it was coming to a tune that was so expensive, it was rivaling the cost of what it would cost to build a brand new institution. So that was the first indication that it's going to be a bit of a problem. Why is it that expensive? Because this is our only hospital like this. The other two hospitals that we have, they're really urgent care centers. They can handle multiple aspects of, um, of health. So this is all that we have. So the challenge would have been, how can we build something whilst keeping all of the other operations running? Or if we're going to be breaking down things, we'll have to build some kind of temporary facility. And some of the changes are so massive, you can't even do piece piece. It, it needs a complete overhaul. And when all of that was taken into consideration, it was absolutely too much. It's not a case like in other countries where you have multiple hospitals and you shut down one and you shut the patients to the others once it fixed. We don't have that luxury. So it forces us to have to it forced us, excuse me, to have to look at the option of a brand new facility in a brand new location. That was the basis behind it. Now we've been very careful with how we've been organizing the operations because um, we have looked at the other territories and a lot of them have had delays with their hospitals because of a barrage of issues. Sometimes it's financial, that's not their fault, but other things based on aspects of poor organization. So we are working again, it's um, a collaborative effort between um, local contractors and the Republic of China and Taiwan, as well as um, another collaboration with um, some professionals from the United States slash Canada, the, the, the team as health institutions in both nations because we're ensuring that all aspects, excuse me, all aspects of the new hospital are done properly. Everything from not just the architectural concept, but also the engineering, the environmental concept with regards to aspects of um, 
uh, what's the term to use? Water, water conservation techniques, mm. um, green energy techniques, ensuring that you know all of the proper soil tests and the basic stuff that those things are done well in advance um, to ensure that the design and this infrastructure layout to ensure that it is in keeping with accreditation standards that are even higher than what would be expected for our size such that if the standards increase with time that we are actually okay to ensure that the space is properly utilized this time such that on the same compound that if we need to make additions in the future that the place is organized such that that could be done with a lot more ease because Janet's problem was the single story spread out across the entire 11 acres. We don't even have a spot that we could corner off and say we'll build from there and go out. So it's just to make sure that we don't fall victim to that. And um, of course, um, the financial aspect of it, it has to all be affordable. It can be anything to cripple the nation um, financially. So we're looking at all of that and working with our partners to make sure that that is done. When all of that had background work is done and it is ready for presentation, it will be presented to the staff of the hospital in the different units such that each unit can look at what their future home is going to be such that they can state up front what, from their own experience, changes change at, at this, uh, the recommendations Re requirements. are their requirements because that's one of the issues that happened with here, the staff was not consulted. Just to summarize it and it was when the building opened that the staff was going into it for the first time and immediately they pointed out problems but it was already done um, it's to prevent something like that happening then after that when it goes back to the drawing board that's when we'll have the finalized one that we could then present to the general public and hopefully we can commence um, actual construction work before the end of this year if everything goes smoothly um, there should be something available for relocation and for official commencement of use within like a two-year span. Um, if there is, of course, act of God or something else that causes a delay, we would apologize for that, but that is the goal that we have right now. So that's the whole story. And the people would just say, you, know, you don't just fix it. It's not as simple. And like I said, these buildings, they're not going to be abandoned. Um, the Ministry of Health already has earmarked quite a number of possible uses um, for for the, um, for the compound, we're just going to finalize that as time goes on. Most likely the moving over to the new building will also be in a gradual process. So bit by bit, well, the main things will be moved and then bit by bit we'll move over things. So for a while we may be occupying two centers in a way that's the most convenient for persons until we get everything, everything finished. But that is basically what's going on. Yeah, Dr. Morton, I was on my way driving in this morning. I thought about the hospital and and you and I spoke about coming to the public to do some consultation and I thought about that so I'm glad you spoke about that because one of the things that I recognize when I came in is that there was some renovation done on the mortuary there we call it morgue in New York but it appears as though that the doctors was not included in what was designed oh. and after I got them involved in the conversation as you as you see we was able to make some adjustments and the altercation we're just waiting on whatever funding to get it going but um, as I've said time and time again we see what's happening in Nevis I don't want us to just put down a building in St. Kitts I want us to be able to serve the community and serve the people so I appreciate what you are saying <laughs> I have, I have to put it in there, Dr. Moore. I have to put it in there. Not, nothing on not, not the original. I have to put it in there because a, a great deal of Nivision Online, by the way, this, this podcast globally. So I know the, the, you might not see the comments I'm seeing them because the comments is there about what's taking place on Navy. So I just had to respond to that person. Just <laughs> uh, we don't want to make those mistakes here and think it's so. And again, Dr. Morton, I spoke to you about a situation last week. And since we have the time, for this, it's the same people online that will be questioning it. There was a video going around about someone who came to the ER and said that um, he had some extra done. And um, it turned out that the doctor told him it was a sprain and then it turned out to be broken feet. When I spoke to you, you said up until that point when I spoke to you last week, you had not had any official report on the matter. Have you received no, any report since? I didn't get an official complaint. Yeah, an official complaint. No, so that, that, that's the issue. I, I did not get any complaint about the situation. If there was a complaint, that is when 
the investigation could be launched to validate or at least explain the claims with a report. Correct. Um, I don't even know if the full complement of staff that would have worked on that case, I don't even know if they were even aware of everything that had taken place for them to even know to prepare a report. So I was just, I was mentioning that up to that point in time, I had not gotten a report, it was just someone went straight to social media with something and here I am wondering when did this happen, if this is, I'm not going to say if this is true because I don't want to cast any doubt on it, but it's just like when did this happen, what are some of the details, etc. Um, the timing is kind of bad with that one because we've really been investing a lot in the radiological services. We had recently started um, Negotiations for that had started. Speak up. Well, the negotiations for that had started since 2022. We uh, we were liaising with um, a team from Germany, um, Dr. Amma Martin. She's um, H. E. Dr. Amma Martin, um, who is a physician in Germany with a radiological background, and she was going to assist us with having an official partnership with. Um, I'm, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> UKSH, I, I cannot, or UKHS, excuse me, I can't pronounce it, a German university, medical um, university, <coughs> um, for them to offer a series of trainings um, to our staff with regards to sharpening and the continuous medical education with regards to radiology, everything to do with x-rays, ultrasound, CT scans, etc. The staff already came with their knowledge, but this was just to top it up even further. In service. Even more. Mm -hmm professional and that is probably going to come on stream um, in a few weeks time and just before we could launch that you know we're topping up a service that we've already been investing in uh, that's some bad news but that's okay well time in Canada the other thing is that um, we invested in we've been investing in the CT scan changing changes that one should be complete by April the company has gone through and that was something again from the Prime Minister when we noted we were having some difficulties uh, with regard to the city scan. Very quickly analyze the situation, present um, the cost analyses, um, and after it was deliberated in very short order, that's when you're told that um, the machine is basically been ordered and it's just to have the other preparation. So the response was swift and the response made sense. Um, we were able to get more staff added to radiology um, since 2023 January, excuse me, um, we added the second radiologist, so it was the first time we had two radiologists working because it really was a lot of stress on Dr. Clark, that was the only radiologist we had before, so it was a 24-7 thing and I don't think people appreciate some of the stuff because when you think about it, like this one person who's a slave to their phone 24-7 for many, many years, anything happened and you need ultrasound, whatever it is, they have to stop wherever they are, go to the hospital, and that that was the case. And she's not being paid a lot of money by the hospital, she's just doing a greater good. Um, but now with two persons being there, at least that burden is being sheared, and with the training that the Germans will offer, um, it would assist with certain aspects of um, our operations, such that that level of strain is not there anymore, and other things. Um, and the MRI, um, the MRI building, the construction for that, in all honesty, should have started already. There are some delays maybe on my control, but um, that will be completed and on stream before the end of this year. Um, the location has been identified quite a long time ago. The plans approved quite a long time ago. Even the funding for the machine um, has been paid for quite a while ago. It's other technicalities that are. Um, Let's say delaying that. So we work when there's a delay, you know, you just walk around, <laughs> walk around it and do what you got to do. Because yeah. <sighs> so anyway, um, and even in X-ray, we are installing right now. Fluoroscopy machine would have been finished on Friday. Slight delay. It's going to be finished by 21st of February. Um, that's an advanced type of X-ray machine, such that we'll have more services to offer to the general public. That's again um, another big plus. So with all of the improvements that we're doing in radiology. Unfortunately, we're human. I tend to get it right all the time. Fully apologize to the gentleman for what he went through. It's never our intention to cause anyone any harm. Um, we are investigating the situation. Um, it's something that really shouldn't happen. So with the full reports that then we could take the proper actions to 
find out was this just um, an issue with this individual person or was this an issue with an entire system or was this an issue with a piece of machinery at least with the report we could finalize that and just prevent that from happening to anyone again as much as we possibly could um, so there is that but the truth yeah. is that in, in, in every part of the hospital we are working we're not ignoring any aspect or any part so even if something is wrong and it's noted I would say before, I mean, you're free to do what you want, but before going to social media, if you let us know, we can Report take it. action on it because we, we haven't really been ignoring things. If something's taken a while, it's not it's not something um, that we are willfully ignoring. It's some kind of technicality. So if you come forth and make the report, um, we can sort it out because if, if that was reported, it would have been sorted out and it wouldn't have um, made it necessary to kind of panic people and make them feel like, this is happening up there all the time still because remember JNF had this negative M many, many years, this many years. Negative it, it, opinion it, it didn't and just been working so hard fixing so many things and like one bad thing would make people revert to thinking that it's the same negative thing that they got accustomed to over the years and it's really not fair. <laughs> so if you report it we'll deal with it. We're not sure if you don't mm -hmm. report it anymore, well, that's fine. We'll still continue working but just for the sake of efficiency if you let us know. So like I said, we're investigating this. Yeah, but Dr. Morton, where should they come to report if there's an incident or uh, issue that they would like to bring to your attention? Where can they find you? They can report it to administration. If it's a bill, the hospital services, they're broken into three branches. If it's an issue with regards to operations or the auxiliary services, um, it is to report it to the direct supervisor of the unit, mm -hmm. and they will then in turn pass on the report to the director of operations at Mrs. Mainhan. If you have follow the chain and you have reported it to the direct supervisor of that unit and you feel as if you're not getting any satisfaction, especially if the complaint was in writing, you can at that point in time then report it um, to Mrs. Maynard stating that you went to the relevant person X amount of time ago and you haven't seen anything happen, so you know, reported it to her. So meaning, let's say you have um, a problem with something in random example, um, the pharmacy, you report it to the chief pharmacist. and. After that, it would be to report it to Mrs. Maynard if you're not getting the level of engagement that you see. Then you escalate it. And you escalate it accordingly. Correct. If it's an issue with the nursing, of course, you report it to the nurse manager for the respective unit. And if you don't think you're getting the right response um, to that, then you can report it to either the matron or the assistant matron. And if it's something with a medical doctor, for the bulk of the medical doctor issues, um, you can actually go to the medical chief of staff because um, those units are so small, so like, even though there's a chief surgeon, only three surgeons are there, you can report it to the chief surgeon, but if you go to the medical chief of staff, it's understood because then at least the conversation can be engaged with regards to um, what happened in this particular um, um, account. If you go straight to me, you kind of skip in some steps. So <laughs> kind of the last, well. last step. Of course, if you speak, I'm not going to chase you away. I'm long mm -hmm. listen, but I would still encourage you Chain to of command. follow the chain of command, even though I'm now aware that I'll be looking out for it shortly. Mm -hmm. Or at least I could ask a question yeah. if too much time passes and I don't see it. And, and Dr. Morton, finally, before we end it, because I told you five minutes and I know we passed five minutes. Um, I must say to you, when you get an opportunity, go and check the comment threads. There are some messages there for you. Positive, of course, so... Uh, no, no, <laughs> but I just want to say to you that I just went through a situation when I left here two weeks ago. I went to one of the bigger hospitals in the Bronx, New York, Montefiore. And for me, it was amazing to see hundreds of patients rolling in and out, some going upstairs, some going out. And I call it a pig pen because the, the stretchers... As big as those emergency rooms were, believe me, the stretchers were touching each other, right? That is how much patience they had. And I remember a gentleman making noise, wanted to leave because he, couldn't, he was there for like, I think he said, 12 hours and he did not get his result from his um, x-ray. And the, ch the chief doctor explained to him that there's only one radiologist, radiologist working. So it's going to be a while. He might not come out till the next morning or whatever the case might be. So when I saw this stuff on social media, I had something to refer to. And I said, well, I have to reach out to you because if big America that has this um, level of people that they can get only have one radiologist reading in a hospital of that size, what we have here at JNF, 
So if you care to explain to the people. Um, well, <laughs> I, tend, no, I tend to view it two ways. That's what I'm going to I tend to view it two ways. On the one hand, I think it's a good thing. Overall, I think it's a good thing that the people in St. Kitts, that they demand quality. To me, that's okay. I would say if you want the quality, you demand the quality. That's perfectly fine. We could be better than everyone and still striving for perfection. That's okay. Um, with regards to the understanding, mm, sometimes it's not there. Um, with regards to the emergency services, we should have some outreach starting shortly to just explain to people how emergency services work because I think if they understood how it worked, it would decrease some of the anxiety and some of the anxiety. Um, all emergency rooms in every country, they operate via triage system, meaning it's not person per service based on the severity of what you need, they need and the need that you might have for emergency. Yeah. So the hospital has a front entrance where people that can walk enter from, but there's also the emergency entrance, which is where the ambulances and stuff come in. You People wouldn't be able to see the ambulance, but sometimes um, you know, the ambulance would come in, there's some big accident or something, and the truth is that everyone is occupied with a genuine emergent <coughs> life and death situation that could cause a delay with regards to you getting the care on the outside because this person could basically rapidly deteriorate before all of the health officials arrive. So if you come in and it's like a cough and cold issue or something that we know you're uncomfortable, but it can wait, unfortunately, you will have to wait until the time comes up. That's how it is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Now, back in the day, only one doctor at a time used to work in the emergency room, which is pretty crazy because to think of it, to have one physician responsible for everybody outside as well as all of the emergencies inside and then the asthma bear which needs constant monitoring as well as anybody that's an inpatient that day. And if it's nighttime, no doctors used to be on the wards. Any emergency that happens on a ward, um, before the consultant comes, you're the first one that has to go. It was, it was crazy. And even if it was there for many years and persons worked with it, that does not mean that it was ideal. It was not ideal. And I'm, it, it just was not ideal. It was not in keeping with any international standard. There's nothing that could defend it. You could say we were a small country and we had limited resources. We did what we had to do. Okay, but if, the, if you can avoid it, you avoid it. So we expanded the emergency room staff by the grace of goodness from COVID um, the emergency room had already been split to have two full rotors of staff and then when COVID ended it was just to try to see how we could continue having um, two physicians working there. We did a trial and everything. We tried to go back to the one physician um, story and it really was very difficult and I, I give them props because they endured it for a bit <laughs> before eventually we had to be like no 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 we have to expand um, emergency room staff so it's two doctors at least on a shift now sometimes you'll see three but even with that being the case sometimes there's a bit of a delay um the place was not is that the design of the place is not you can look at it and realize this this one consultation room for the doctors in the emergency room so when it was built the genius that built it never ever thought of having more than one physician working here. and other things like they, they scream at you when you see certain things built in a certain way are done in a certain way that it's it's hardwired so it's hard to work around it but we try to work around it um what we what we will be doing over the course of the next few days will be um ticking up some more um posters on the inside so persons could understand the triage system understand what categorizes as an urgency versus an emergency versus um something that's mild versus something versus something that's moderate um, and with that being there, persons will know a little bit more because there are some things, if it's a moderate um, situation with the examples, the expected international waiting time sometimes is in the region of um, two to three hours time. And that is actually um, expected slash okay. Um, maximum, sorry, maximum two to three hours, that's expected slash okay. And other things are emergent. So if you have an asthma attack, you don't wait for that. You, you, you walk right in. That's why we don't have any buzzers or barriers on the door because if you're struggling to breathe, we'll pick it up, we'll assist you, you go right in. If you're acutely heavily bleeding, if you're acutely heavily bleeding, um, you're expected as well to don't sit outside and bloody up the place. Of course not. And also have massive blood loss. 
go inside, get everyone's attention, etc. And I think most people, they automatically don't wait for that. But um, for other things, we, uh, you know, people might be panicking, thinking it's a possibility that I have XYZ um, when, you know, maybe the vital signs are pretty stable, so the likelihood is not too high. That's when people get kind of antsy, or if they're in some kind of discomfort, um, or some kind of pain, even if it's mild to moderate, and it's taking a while for them to get a diagnosis and treatment, that's also um, something to work on. We don't wish for anyone to be in any kind of discomfort like that. But bit by bit, especially within your medical chief of staff, we've been working on improving that, and even with regards to quality assurance, um, on the medical side, we are upgrading that to ensure that there are officers there, or at least one main officer per person there to ensure when you enter with X complaint that you get this, this and this within a time span of 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, just to ensure that nobody drops the ball. Um, we will be having a health information system being installed. It's already being installed. The infrastructure is there just to um, select the software and a few other tweaks with the infrastructure so in a few months' time. When that is done and someone comes inside at least now, when specific complaints are lodged, you have a timeline, a, a digital timeline okay. of when the person got the complaint. So if you come in and your complaint is, I have chest pain, for example, you should get EKG within this time, this blood sick off within this time, this and this. And when you do it and you can then register it in the system, we can then check at the end of whatever period yeah, that the and, came and our action to take. Uh, and 20 minutes before they got that, it's supposed to be 10. And right. you, you could pinpoint. Mm. Um, so now we still try, but without the assistance, without the assistance of the digitization, it's a little bit difficult. So there is that. Yeah, well, Dr. Morton, I see that you are in high demand, so I'm going to give you the opportunity. I'm going to give you the opportunity to thank anybody you want to thank, whether your staff, the government, okay. whatever, okay. and um, we'll, we'll, we'll run. There's quite a few things I'd like to thank, of course, the government cabinet the government for giving me this opportunity. I was just someone that I was um, very passionate about this, um, but I thought because of you know, the age and stuff, then there might have been some reservations, but I'm glad I was able to be given this opportunity. One of the reasons why I work so hard, um, it's because not just for myself, but it's to encourage, um, encourage more with regards to giving younger persons more opportunities. Of course, I always lean on experienced persons um, to ensure that the guidance is always there but i'm grateful for that i'm thankful for all of the hard work in staff at jns um, the administrative staff the supervisory staff and all of the other staff um, because this hospital over 500 people work here so um, it's not no one-man effort when you see things happening so even the slightest thing um, I have some very hard working staff in like kitchen, laundry, maid staff, they work very hard and a lot of times it's like an unsung hero situation so everybody in the hospital um, um, is important. Um, Mrs. Maynard has really been a little right hand <laughs> so I'm grateful um, that she's the director of operations. Dr. Wilkin, hard working um, as the medical chief of staff, went straight to work from day one um, when it was official hard, hard, ridiculously hard working, sometimes concerningly hard working, but it's very good. Um, and of course, the largest subset of workers in the hospital, the nurses, make up half of all the medical staff. Um, they are nurses, so we can't do anything without them. They are the spine of the whole system. Um, we are always trying to work to see how we could improve um, things and modernize things um, with regards to the nurses. Um, and they are the ones that are here 24 7 with regards to aspects of patient care so i'd like to thank them as well but everything is a work in progress so thank you thank you dr morton and i want to say to you i appreciate you and appreciate the opportunity to work with you and again i want to thank the prime minister for his efforts and i will continue to do my part all right, all right sir yeah folks i was speaking to the dhid director of health institute here Dr. Morton, and um, again, here is some of the material that came in from overseas that is being used to attack the, address the leaks on the roof here at the JNF. I'm going to take a final walk through here and the medical and um, 
the medical and the surgical area here at the JNF. As you can see, this is the before. Nothing has been done to this side as yet. So you will see the finished product just as the other side. All of this work here is this is the um, original problems. So this is some of the top coating that I put, they're putting on here. Still have to get several coating, but um, the technology looks nice. I appreciate the work of these individuals. And as I said, it has been a very big job. You know, there's some new portable AC split units. These are the condensers on the outside, evaporators on the inside that has been employed here and the ward. So when I came in in September, there were several people complaining about the heat and there's no fan. Um, and the wards, well, guess what? Prime Minister Drew and his team ensure that there is air condition on all wards, medical, surgical, and the other wards are getting some assistance as well. So again, I want to thank Prime Minister Drew for his expedition in getting these folks going. Yes, this is another area here. This is the start of the sealant to address the, the leaks here on the roof over in this area. So my good people, as I said earlier, I did not plan to stay as long as I did. If we look right on the opposite side here of this building, here, for those new contractors that might be familiar with how work is done. When I look at this particular building, you realize that these galvanize, they got screws on the hip and in the valley. And one of the things that I observe here is that this roof is going to have to be replaced as well. Because where you have the screws in the valley, once those screw heads get rust, rotted, rusty, or the sealant between them, then water will seep under those screws and go on the inside. So. When you have people working on your properties, you have to make sure you got people that know what they're doing. Because folks should know you're not supposed to be screwing galvanized on the valley, only on the hip. Because once you put screws on the valley, eventually water will find its way inside of your property. So, my good people, same thing here on this side. You have screws on the hip and screws in the valley. You cannot put screws in the valley on your house. You're going to have leaks. Even in your private home. Pay attention to what the contractors are doing. Don't allow them to put screws in the valley of your galvanize. Okay? So, in the essence of time, DJ Marisha will call it a day. In the essence of time, I will close off my live now. Yep. In the essence of time, I will say, my good people, it was good to be in here, giving you a quick update on what's transpired here at the NF. And I was happy that Dr. Morton was able to join me in this regard to give you the general public at home and in the diaspora a little update on what we are having here. So Brother Eustace Hendrickson, you have asked me to do a live from the JNF. I would hope that you are satisfied with the information that you receive. My boy, Brother Ivor Henry, and I will Senator John Clark. I know you as well have always asked me to give some updates on what's taking place here at the JNF. So, my good people, before I leave you, let me say a good day to Sister Gwyneth Marisha, Sister Beverly Marisha, how are you doing? Compliment.
going to Jerusalem. Let's see. Let's see. The man Craig. Show us the man Twinkie. We used to catch in the crew. I want to say a very special thank you to my engineer there. But I like for your continued work to keep my platform going on social media. I also want to thank my nephew, Glenville Lawrence, for continuing the hard work to give me my edits weekly, my clips to keep the program going. I want to be up my folks across the Nevis. Sister Loretta, how are you doing over there? And the culture of my bar, my boy Cabo. How are you doing, brother Cabo? I'll see you in front of you on Saturday. Um, my boy Mikey Slack, how are you doing? The man of Pemberton, Muffet Slack. Sister Hazel Clarkson, how are you doing? Lita Pontin, Joseph Cannon, I.B. Carty. Are you in the Mitchum, the man Julian Pemberton, how are you doing? Aston Williams. How about the man Luther Kelly? My son, the Jack Foy Jr. over there in the LA area. How are you doing? How is Sister Jazz? My baby girl, and she should be in school at the moment in cold New York. How about my sister, the interpreter, sister Esther? I just pass out how is my teacher and the kids. My boy, brother Ken, buddy, and Thomas. How are you doing? How is Sister Tom? My brother called Morris. How are you doing? I'm here and I'm going to get ready to sign off in a bit, but not before I say good morning to my sister there, Sister Cicely Brown, Pastor Brown there, and the island of Nevis. Hope all is well with you. And until such time, stay safe, one love. Yeah, man.